honorable judges ladies and gentlemen a very warm good evening to each and all of you we are to commence the program in a short while may i kindly request the honorable dignitaries to now occupy the dais in absolute silence the lord sees hears and speaks let us commence today's program with a silent prayer let us also offer our prayers in respect of our always beloved senior advocate kp dandapani thank you we will commence the program on behalf of the high court of kerala honorable mr justice vinod chandran senior judge high court of kerala will now welcome honorable mr justice yu yu lalit with a bouquet of flowers advocate navin t secretary kerala high court advocates association will now welcome this august gathering honorable mr justice yu yu lalit former chief justice of india honorable mr justice bachu kurian thomas judge high court of kerala honorable judges attending this function senior advocate ravindranath menon senior counsel for taxes government of india senior advocate jaju babu patron constitution debate club advocate biju s vice president of the association former judges senior advocates other dignitaries of the dais my dear lawyer friends staff of the registry students clerks ladies and gentlemen wish you all a lovely evening we are assembled here to attend a lecture on the topic evolution of independence of judiciary as a basic feature of the constitution we are fortunate to have with us honorable mr justice yu yu lalit former chief justice of india who have graciously consented to deliver a lecture and to take us to the breadth and length of the subject i on behalf of the kerala high court advocates association and also on behalf of the constitution debate club and all who gathered here most courteously welcome you sir to this august august gathering i request advocate sri hari rao to kindly come on the dais to give away a bouquet to our chief guest we all knew that this program is organized in commemoration of golden jubilee of keshavan de bharati case with the permission of the chair i take this opportunity to inform all that 
Sri Keshavan Dabardi is the maternal uncle of Advocate Sri Hari Rao. Sri Keshavan Dabardi, a name which is not just familiar to the lawyer community or law students, but a must known fact over five decades and years to come. Now, we have with us Honorable Mr. Justice Vechu Kurian Thomas, Judge High Court of Kerala, to give introductory remarks on the topic. I, on behalf of the Kerala High Court Advocate Association and also on behalf of the Constant Debate Club and all who gathered here, most lovingly welcome you, sir, to this wonderful event. I, on behalf of the association, CDC and all gathered here, extend a pleasant welcome to Senior Advocate Ravin Srinatha Menon, Senior Counsel for Taxes, Government of India, Senior Advocate Jaju Babu, Patron CDA, and Advocate Biju as Vice President of the Association to this function. I wholeheartedly welcome all the Honorable Judges, former Judges, Senior Advocates, Lawyer Friends, Staff of the Registry, Students, Clerks and all who assembled here to make this function a meaningful one. Thank you. Today's program jointly conducted by the Kerala High Court Advocates Association and the Constitution Debate Club commemorates the 50th year of a celebrated judgment, Keshavananda Bharati versus State of Kerala. Constitution Debate Club was conceived as an active platform for discourses, lectures, and interactive sessions on legal and law-related issues. The club, which is a part of Cochin Law Review Association, constituted under the Travancore Cochin Scientific, Literary and Societies Act 1955, is a prominent presence for intellectual interactions in this High Court. Under the patronage of Senior Counsel P.K. Ravindranath Menon and Senior Counsel K. Jaiju Babu, and with the guidance of Honorable Mr. Justice Bechu Kurian Thomas, who was an active member of this club till his Lordship's elevation. This club functions as an impartial and non-political intellectual presence with the help and support of Kerala High Court Advocates Association. May I now request Honorable Mr. Justice Bechu Kurian Thomas to offer introductory remarks. Honorable Mr. Justice U. U. Lalit, former Chief Justice of India, other distinguished members on the days, brothers and sisters, and my dear fellow lawyers, my, my dear members of the bar, ladies and gentlemen. The event organized at the auspicious of the Kerala High Court Advocates Association and the Constitutional Debate Club receives, requires great appreciation. A constitutional court having a constitution debate club is worth mentioning. And this event is one of the many events that they've been organizing in the past years. We are really fortunate to have Justice Yu Yu Lalit to address us today. In 1967, when the Supreme Court declared in Golaknath's case that fundamental rights cannot be amended by the Parliament, a battle on the extent of powers to amend the Constitution began. The tussle culminated with the judgment of the largest bench of the Supreme Court deciding the longest case ever fought in any court in the world regarded as the greatest constitutional case ever decided by the Supreme Court of India. The judgment in Keshavananda Bharati introduced into the Indian constitutional law the doctrine that parliament cannot alter the basic structure of the constitution, even by a constitutional amendment. Keshavananda Bharati case became the taproot of a colossal tree called 
the constitution of India. While letting the tree grow, extending its shades to all those within it, the taproot holds it strong and keeps it grounded without letting it fall down, even amidst typhoons and cyclones that come hitting against it. On April 24, 1973, by a wafer-thin majority of seven is to six, which was brought in by a view of the majority, the basis structure, structure doctrine evolved. To overcome the effect of Keshavananda Bharati case, the 42nd Amendment to the Constitution was brought in. The amendment gave unrestrained power to the Parliament to amend any part of the Constitution with absolute restraint on the power of judicial review. The doctrine of basic structure found its real utterance in 1980 in the Minerva Mills case, when the Supreme Court struck down that part of the 42nd Amendment to the Constitution as infringing the basic structure of the Constitution. It is remarkable and it is a beauty of the doctrine that what was introduced to destroy it was demolished by the very same doctrine itself. These decisions highlight the importance of an independent judiciary in the country. Our country learned from experience that the bedrock of every democracy is a rule of law and an independent judiciary is a fount of the rule of law. Article 50 of the Constitution specifically obligates the state to separate the judiciary from the executive in public services. An independent judicial system is a need of every state which upholds the values of liberty, justice, and equality. By an independent judicial system, what is meant is not just a separate establishment, but an establishment with the ability to take decisions fearlessly, uninfluenced by any other factor other than the constitution and law. An independent appointment process in the matter of selection of judges, devoid of political, religious, or other considerations, is therefore a sine qua non for an independent judiciary. In this context, we must remind ourselves, it is neither the parliament nor the judiciary that is supreme, but it is the constitution that is supreme. And our constitution contemplates as its basic structure an independent judiciary. Justice Yuju Lalit has been a champion of the independence of judiciary. He has been a voice against intrusion into the independence which we enjoy as a judicial system. Two months ago, I had the pleasant experience of attending one of his sessions on constitutional law at the National Judicial Academy. It was really a pleasant experience. His erudite and inspiring lecture kept all of us at the academy spellbound. His mastery of the subject was truly reflected in that session. In this golden jubilee year of Keshavananda Bharati case, we are certainly blessed to be able to hear the master himself, that too, on the topic, evolution of independence of judiciary as a basic feature of the Constitution. Thank you. Honorable Mr. Justice Yuyu Lalit, born into a legacy, left a legacy when he demitted office as the Honorable Chief Justice of India on 8th of November 2022. His Lordship's remarkable innings in the field of law commenced with his enrollment in 1983 and continued through his practice in the High Courts of Bombay and Delhi and the Supreme Court, where he was designated as the senior counsel in 2004. Trusted by the bench and bar, his lordship was appointed as amicus curie in many important matters. His lordship was appointed as the special public prosecutor for CBI to conduct trial in all 2G matters under the orders of the Supreme Court. His Lordship was appointed as the Judge of the Supreme Court in 2014 and as the Chief Justice of India on 27th of August, 2022. An erudite judge, a gentle gentleman, compassionate to a cause, 
and committed to the learning of law. His Lordship continues his love for law by being a faculty in prominent law schools. May I now invite Honorable Mr. Justice UU Lalit, former Chief Justice of India, to deliver lecture on the topic of the day. Honorable Justice Bechu Kurian Thomas, Senior Advocate Mr. Babu, Senior Advocate Mr. Menon, Mr. Biju, Learned Advocate. These are the office bearers who are concerned with the organization which has successfully been running this lecture series. The Honorable Justice Vinod Chandran, and other honorable judges of the High Court, the senior advocates, junior advocates who are present in large number, ladies and gentlemen. 50 years since the celebrated judgment in Keshwanand Bharati was delivered by the Supreme Court. The gentleman came from this state, God's own country, and has given us great fulcrum on which the entire jurisprudence has since then developed. I also had the privilege to get associated with another milestone in environmental law, which is the Godavarman, another gentleman coming from this state. These are celebrated cases which have nurtured and developed jurisprudential thinking. And one of the basic ideas which Justice Thomas dealt with just now is the takeaway from this judgment that says that the inherent limitation on the power of the, of the constituent power to amend the constitution, the power of the parliament to amend the constitution, is circumscribed by certain theories that you can amend everything but not the basic structure of the constitution, something which is considered to be so basic for the existence of not only the country, the communities, and even the individual. So these basic structures or the facets of basic structure comprise of various nuances, like the democratic principle that we have subscribed to, adult suffrage, one man, one vote, periodic, intervention by the electorate to select the, their representatives, the socialist republic, that the apparatus that we have devised for ourselves, and among other things, there's a concept such as independence of judiciary. There are various articles with justice Thomas mentioned just now, which as a goal guide us in one direction and that is to have independent judiciary. Some of the democratic countries starting right from Marbury versus Madison, they have always insisted that the power of the judicature to annul any instrument of law or executive action is a very sacrosanct power and that is something which is directly derivable from the basic document that's the American Constitution. We have also been guided by that ethos, those principles. 
and therefore the structure of our constitution also incorporates various segments and specially the checks and balances but an issue had arisen and that is precisely why the entire supreme court had to sit and consider the issue whether in its constituent power whether the parliament could amend any provision of the constitution or whether there can be read some inherent limitations within which that power has to be exercised and the celebrated judgments in keshwanand bharti which decided the matter 7 is to 6 by a very slender majority never has since then the full court of the supreme court ever sat except for one instance where perhaps i think 13 judges had again sat just to consider whether the matter requires to be reviewed or not but the matter was completely abandoned the largest bench since then was tma pi which was 11 judges what this judgment laid down though not in clear and precise terms on an ideological plane it was accepted that there are certain features of the constitution which are so inviolable and which are so important for the very existence of the democracy in the country and in order to help an individual to achieve the fullest of his potential that those principles cannot be frittered away cannot be amended cannot be modified or substituted by something else in today's discussion we will consider two facets of the matter because the moment we say judiciary it is the organizational structure the constitution or what constitutes what we normally call the superior judiciary so therefore the first part is the organization who constitutes the court how the judges are appointed how the judges then have to take their seats and what is the what is the paramount consideration the second part is of course the powers to be exercised by the judicature if it is accepted norm that we go by the idea of separation of powers and the basic job to interpret the constitution to interpret the laws and to give down a binding judgment which judgment must thereafter guide the execution of everything in fact all your actions thereafter if that's the power that we give to the judicature the thinking has always developed that there must be complete independence so far as the functional issues are concerned and those functional issues normally get coined as what we normally say rule of law or the extent of powers whether those powers could be curtailed rule of law was specifically referred to as one of the basic features in the constitution by some of the judges who constituted the bench but our discussion is that how this ethos has since then developed and i will deal with just two or three cases on the point and then move on to the other segment the two articles which were incorporated one by perhaps 32nd amendment and the other by 42nd amendment one incorporated a provision in the constitution which enabled the state to come out with a law dealing with administrative tribunals in the state of andhra pradesh 
And one of the sub-articles, that is 243D, into bracket 3, and then into bracket 5, two sub-articles dealt with one issue. Number one, sub-article 3 said, that such a law made by the state may empower or may confer jurisdiction upon the tribunal which is exercisable or to be exercised by all the courts except the Supreme Court of India. Which is to say that apart from preserving the normal jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, whether it is under 32 or 136 or any such thing, so far as the other jurisdictional issues are concerned, perhaps the power can be conferred upon the tribunals to be put in place by virtue of the power so given under this article, sub-article 3. Sub-article 5 said, that the determination made by such tribunals shall be subject to confirmation by the executive. Proviso to that sub-article 5 then empowered the state that such a law made by the state could as well give the power to the executive to substitute its own findings in place of the finding rendered by the tribunal. That is to say that the power of the executive to modify the finding rendered by the tribunal. This is what the amendment thought of. Why we are going into this issue? Because Keshwanan Bharti said that the power of the parliament to amend hereafter of course, there is the other facet of the matter, which is that Coelho principle, which I'll come to it later. But the power of the parliament hereafter shall be subject to what is called inherent limitations, which are basic features of the constitution. And one of them was rule of law, as laid down by the judgments on the point. This amendment came into force sometime in 74. Then in 76, 42nd Amendment came into force, which inter alia incorporated one more article, or rather two articles in the Constitution, again empowering the Parliament to enact a law, as a result of which, or with the help of which, central administrative tribunals could be put in place. These tribunals, now mark the difference or distinction in 32nd amendment, the provision simply said that the law can confer upon the tribunals powers exercisable by courts other than the Supreme Court. Now the amendment now speaks of that the parliament can empower the tribunal to deal with, of course, everything which is supposed to be substitute for high court. But it also said that the power, the parliament can by law exclude the jurisdiction of courts other than the Supreme Court. So mark the distinction or difference. Number one, first of all, in a very mild format to say, that the provisions could empower the tribunal to exercise powers exercisable by courts other than the Supreme Court. And now you go a step further and say, very well, such a law can exclude the power which was exercisable by courts other than the Supreme Court. Next article gave the power to the parliament to come out with tribunals dealing with various other issues 
in terms of which certain tribunals like Central Excise and Gold Appellate Tribunal and so on and so forth could be established or in various states some of the tribunals dealing with tax matters were established. Now it so happened that the challenges to these amendments were heard by the same bench presided over by Justice Bhagwati who was then the Chief Justice. By the time Justice Bhagwati had rendered a judgment in Minerva Mills which was the bench presided over by Chief Justice Chandrachud and Justice Bhagwati's judgment is actually a minority judgment in which he inter alia said that of course rule of law is very sacrosanct but we cannot be misunderstood to say that the parliament is not empowered to put in place alternate or alternative institutional mechanism quote unquote this is the phrase which he uses in Minerva Mills when the challenge is raised to both these amendments 32nd and so far as this 42nd amendment the matter concerning the administrative tribunals including the challenge to the legislation which was brought in force as a result of that power was dealt with by the court first which is the celebrated judgment in Sampat Kumar in Sampat Kumar two judgments rendered one by Justice Bhagwati a concurring view and the principal judgment is by Justice Ranganath Mishra who later became the Chief Justice of the court. In that judgment, the very same expression which was used by Justice Bhagwati in Minerva Mills that there can be alternative institutional mechanism. It became the fulcrum for the judgment to say that very well High Court's jurisdiction may have been taken away or excluded but equally efficacious jurisdiction has been conferred upon central administrative tribunals and therefore the parliament would be well within its competence to do so. The challenge in Sampat Kumar was thus negated. Soon thereafter, the challenge with regard to the other set of articles came up before the court and that is P. Samba Murti, another judgment by a constitution bench of the Supreme Court. Relying on Sampat Kumar, the bench in Samba Murti, which is a judgment authored by Chief Justice Bhagwati again, they reject the theory or the submission that there cannot be exclusion of jurisdiction. So they accept that theory. So therefore the challenge to sub-article 3 was negated. But so far as challenge to sub-article 5 was concerned, Justice Bhagwati says, it is unheard of that the determination by a tribunal which is supposed to be a substitute for the high court could be modified by the executive. He says this is shocking and this will be subversive of the principle of rule of law. So he put it on that quote unquote principle of rule of law that by separation of powers we have accepted a mechanism where adjudication is the function of the judicature or at best a substitute for that organ but how can the executive where 
the executive itself will be before the tribunal in the capacity as one of the parties to the dispute can be conferred upon the power to set at naught the determination made by the tribunal and therefore p samba murti sub article 5 was held to be invalid these two judgments actually chart out a course as to what exactly can be the modality when you are having a substitute for the regularly exercisable power by the superior court including the high court very well then thereafter the issues came up the doubts were expressed whether the central administrative tribunal could go into the constitutional validity of some of the rules enacted by virtue of power conferred under article 309 doubts were expressed whether the tribunal is competent or not competent some of the judgments rendered by the supreme court did say that yes the tribunal must the moment you accept in theory that it's a substitute for the high court then it must have the requisite power very well that's the second stage a judgment by ap high court was a path breaking judgment in this direction that judgment the division bench of the high court said among other things number 1 this fulcrum which was the basis of sampat kumar that the parliament has the power to have an alternative institutional mechanism in place and thereby substitute the regular power exercisable by the high court in a writ jurisdiction under 226 has never been accepted by the supreme court the genesis of that observation was in the minority judgment of justice bhagwati in minerva mills which has then been expounded to be the foundation for further theory number 2 all through everything all like judgments like keshav singh judgment like samsher singh judgments judgments after judgment it has always been accepted that the power of a writ court and the articles which are 226 136 32 and 227 a sacrosanct and therefore how could there be a substitute to the jurisdiction exercised under 226 it virtually said that the judgment under sampat kumar in sampat kumar was per incurium that was the determination by division bench of ap high court judgment authored by justice mn rao who later became the chief justice of himachal pradesh high court a challenge came before the supreme court in l chandra kumar a bench of seven judges and judgment authored by chief justice ahmadi and he accepted what division bench of andhra had done he said that yes there can't be complete exclusion such an exclusion of the power of constitutional court we don't subscribe to we don't accept that judicial review again the fulcrum of the judgment is what judicial review by constitutional courts is the basic feature of the constitution and therefore even in its constituent power of amending the constitution the parliament could not have put in place a machinery or an apparatus which would exclude the jurisdiction of the high courts as a result of l chandra kumar we are all aware as a legal fraternity that the determination made by the tribunal which was either to before could be challenged only in supreme court 
is now assailable before the High Court under its 226 jurisdiction because that 226 has to be preserved. Now going by that standard perhaps that sub-article 3 which in Sambamurti the court relied upon Sampat Kumar as a student of law in according to me must also suffer the same consequences and therefore there cannot be a complete substitution for the power of the high court. Why did I choose these judgments or these decisions? Because they go to the very root of... See, we are not getting into the questions of intent behind the legislature or any kind of effect of that legislation. We are going purely on the issue of power. What does our constitution contemplate? It contemplates a judicature which is to be at the apex level is the Supreme Court, at state levels are the high courts. They are supposed to be the constitutional courts which have been conferred upon the powers under 226. And that has always been construed and considered to be the basic feature of the constitution. Any attempt to eat into that or any attempt to modify that or to diminish the value or the extent of that power has not been accepted by the Supreme Court. So that's where we stand as a result of these three judgments on the point. Then we come to the next level of matters. which is Kihoto Holohon. Kihoto Holohon dealt with challenge with respect to para 7 of the 10th schedule to the constitution. 10th schedule to the constitution was amended by the constitution to bring in the concept of anti-defection in the political parties or at the political apparatus. The idea was that the Indian electorate at times gives a vote for a political party. So therefore they show or they repose confidence in a particular political setup as a result of which we should not allow crossing over at the political party level. Subject to certain exceptions like split in the party or a merger of a political party into another one as is dealt with under 10th schedule, it is well accepted that if a person who has been elected by a political party crosses over and joins B political party, then he can be subject to disqualification. The disqualification then has to be determined by the person presiding over the house. In case of Lok Sabha, it could be speaker. In case of Rajya Sabha, it could be the chairperson of Rajya Sabha, so on and so forth at the state levels. While giving this power to the speaker, para 7 of the amendment, 10th schedule, said that the decisions of the speaker in the matter of defection and disqualification shall be final. One of these submissions which was advanced when the challenge was raised that how can you, by virtue of this para 7, take away the rights of the courts under 226 to enter into any controversy. One of the defenses which were raised on behalf of the state government were, or the union government were, that these are typically political issues and therefore the normal courts may not be so competent or good enough to consider these challenges. That submission was rejected. 
there were two facets to the matter. Para 7 of the constitution, para 7 of this particular schedule, the majority judgment rendered by Justice Venkat Chale on behalf of himself and two other judges dealt with one part and namely that the moment it inferentially or even indirectly impinges upon the jurisdiction of the courts, there had to, by virtue of Article 368 of the Constitution, there had to be appropriate ratification from the states. And in the absence of such ratification, Para 7 could not be made effective. So this was the line which went with Justice Venkat Chalaya, that's the majority judgment. But the minority judgment rendered by Justice J.S. Varma went to the extent of saying, not just 368 violation because there is no appropriate ratification, but the fact that you can make the decision of the speaker final and non-challengeable in any other court itself violates the basic feature of the constitution. These are judgments which have gone to the level of saying that certain areas cannot be encroached upon. The power of the judicature to go into the question as to validity of an instrument, whether it is legislative or whether it is executive order, is sacrosanct. And it cannot be frittered away or it cannot be modified to such an extent that you make it completely extinct or exclude that power. These judgments tell you that on the functional side, the superior courts have always been held to be, their powers are held to be limitless or without any kind of restrictions or without any kind of exclusion. As everybody is aware, there are certain exclusions in the constitution itself, which was the original constitution, 136.2, and 227.4 do not allow the superior courts to go into the determination made by military tribunals. So there is a clear bar under the constitution itself. That's the intent which was available in the original constitution. Other areas, there is no such restriction. And these are the judgments which tell you on the functional side there can't be restriction of powers of the judicature. Now let us go on the, on the constitution of the courts as such. What has since then weighed with the courts? Soon after the decision in Keshwanan Bharti, the first judge's case was decided by a bench of seven judges. The issue was whether while consulting the Chief Justice in the matters of appointment of judges to High Court and Supreme Court, whether the opinion given by the Chief Justice has a primacy or whether the executive, whatever the executive decides has to be given the primacy. Are they to be guided, the executive to be guided by what the Chief Justice says? And a bench of seven judges went into the matter, decision went by four is to three in favor of the executive to say that in such matters there is no primacy to the opinion given by the Chief Justice. This was in the wake of or in the backdrop of judgments like Sakal Chanset. Sakal Chanset, again a bench of five judges had said that in the matters of transfer of judges of the High Court, the opinion of the Chief Justice must be given due weightage and due respect. But 
this bench of seven judges took a different view in the matter. So that was our first case, first judge's case. The second judge's case, which was a bench of nine judges, took a diametrically opposite view on the strength of the language in the articles of the constitution as they stood or as they had already stood right from the first judge's case. And according to them, going by the fact that the judiciary must be independent, we must always have qualitatively good material as judges and who else except the chief justice or the superior or the judges in that court could be considered to be best judges to make the appropriate choices and appointments or suggest the appointments. On that score, the bench of nine judges then decided that in matters of appointment, the opinion of the chief justice must be given some primacy. The matter did not rest there. Another special reference where the president sought the opinion of the Supreme Court, another bench of nine judges, that also dealt with in the same fashion. The only distinction it made was that it put in place what we presently call the collegium system who is supposed to be making the appointments or making recommendations that so and so persons be appointed or transferred or to be elevated as judges of the Supreme Court or even to be elevated as chief justices of various high courts. Mind you, so far as district judiciary is concerned, everything pertaining to district judiciary, whether it is posting, appointment, promotions, transfers, or disciplinary actions can be taken only by the High Court, though in the name of the executive, the final orders are passed. So the model which was sought to be put in place was a revised model even for the superior judiciary that the executive role in the, in the matter be minimized to the level possible and the primacy be given to the opinion of the Chief Justice and judges forming the Collegium. This was the system which was in existence till 2014. When the 99th Amendment was brought in force, as a result of which the Parliament thought of putting in place what is called National Judicial Appointments Commission. This amendment was brought in after taking due ratification from more than 50% states in terms of 368. So look at the extent to which the amending power had gone. The attempt was again challenged by SCAURA, that is Supreme Court Advocates on Record Association before the Supreme Court by way of a writ petition. A bench of five judges went into that matter and by a majority of four is to one, all four judges forming the majority have written opinions but the lead judgment is by Justice Kher. And the minority view is expressed by Justice Chalameshwar. And look at the extent to which it has gone. It has accepted what was laid down in Sakal Chan Seth and other cases, Samsher Singh, to say that the constitutional court's jurisdiction is such that it would require persons of eminence to be brought to the court as judges and there should be least possible interference from the executive side 
and therefore these two nine judges bench decisions what what had thought of and what had put in place subserved the interest of independence of judiciary to such an extent that that model was actually a better model then the other parts that what has been put in place as a result of the amendment that is njac whether it is a good substitute or not now so far as the appointment commission is concerned as to who shall form part of that commission apart from three persons coming from the supreme court that is judges numbers 1 2 3 there could be two political executives rather three and there could be two eminent legal jurists it was also observed that when it comes to appointment of judges perhaps these three political executives do not have the requisite experience or the expertise to make the appropriate choices similarly the other two persons who are the legal jurists may not also have that kind of adequate experience where they had seen the performance of some of the persons whose candidature actually is in question and therefore this amendment on the touchstone of what is independence of judiciary must suffer the consequences and has to be rendered ineffective on the principles laid down in keshwanan bharti now look at the the way keshwanan bharti has been the fulcrum in this direction when it comes to independence of judiciary not just on the functional side as to what matters should or should not come before the courts but even when it comes to the constitution of courts as to who shall constitute the courts as to how the persons concerned shall be selected how the persons concerned the entire selection process should go about this is where two ideas have actually emerged and that to my mind is the greatest contribution of the dictum in keshwanand bharti it has not only on the functional side but even on the what is called the formation or the organizational side or the structural side it has also been the fulcrum for the development of law in that behalf the third part which i dealt with that was coelho that again is a judgment which is a very fundamental judgment article 31b says as it is up to the parliament to put certain laws enacted by various legislatures whether it is state legislature or the parliament to put them in ninth schedule and the moment these are acts are put in the ninth schedule the ground of challenge that it violates any of the fundamental rights cannot be entertained by the court vaman rao dealt with at the for the first time whether post keshwanand bharti can we go into this question because keshwanand bharti has opened what is called the the flood gate and said that very well everything must satisfy basic features of the constitution coelho dealt with that matter and said post the date which is the date when keshwanand bharti was delivered the courts will be competent to consider whether or not those legislations which have been put in the ninth schedule do they actually satisfy the muster or not Now that's where you have the entire gamut of 
इंडिपेंडेंस ऑफ जुडिशरी विच हैज बीन डेल्ट विथ बाय वेरियस जजमेंट्स ऑफ द सुप्रीम कोर्ट not just on any kind of i won't call it as an onslaught but any attempt to detract from the powers of the court on the functional side on the organizational side you have the judgments which are three judges three judgments first judges case second judges case third judges case and then thereafter njsc where the supreme court has charted a course and said that very well for the administration of justice for the independence of judiciary this is something which is sacrosanct and is absolutely essential and necessary and then the dimension which has actually been reiterated in coelho of course there was a thought in mamavan rao but this has now been put beyond any doubt in coelho judgment by justice yk sabarwal on the point seven judges these are the matters where we can proudly say as students of law that the development has been such which was to ensure the independence of judiciary in this country whatever was spoken of as a power of the court in marbury versus madison is not only accepted by this country but this country has gone way beyond and has now ensured that the appointment of judges must also be something which must be elevated to that level why because that's one way to ensure and assure to the entire country the independence in judiciary this to my mind ladies and gentlemen is the evolution since keshwanand bharti on the front what we normally call independence of judiciary there are of course passages but i won't bother you reading them there are beautiful passages one by justice ahmadi in in chandra kumar there is a beautiful passage by justice kehar in the judgment which is the njsc judgment and there is another beautiful passage by justice sabarwal in coelho which i don't want to read out to the assembly you are you are persons coming from the field of law you are well aware of that thank you thank you so much the kerala high court advocates association and the constitution debate club plays on record their gratitude to his lordship mr justice u u lalit for this intellectually stimulating lecture may i with his lordship's permission request those amongst the audience who may like to ask his lordship few clarifications or questions it's all right to be here before the assembly is is a great pleasure so therefore whoever has questions yes please shoot um, sir uh, the question might sound uh, a little impertinent um, sir uh, i think in latin or in early uh, christian theology i think there's a concept of via negativa via negativa is the study of what not to do now conceptually i'm sorry am i audible no uh, i missed the first sentence i just wanted to tell you can you just repeat that sir in latin all in early christian theology there is a concept of via negativa uh, via negativa is the study of what not to do correct now uh, independence of judiciary is it better to understand that concept conceptually through the framework of via negativa or do you uh, understand that concept as a sanctified pulpit where you can't it's so sacred that 
uh, it's so sacrosanct that you can't uh, go beyond it. Do you, do you use the via negativa framework to understand it as a subtractive concept or do you understand it with a, a level of sanctity? See, there are multiple dimensions. Don't just go by this subtractive or additive concept, correct? It's a, it's a concept which is essentially sui generis. And the idea is that anything which puts a doubt or diminishes the extent of powers will be taken to be opposed to the principle of what is called you know, the, the encroachment on the power. So therefore that's on the functional side. That is where what we said is, look at the way that can the executive sit in appeal over the decision made by the judicature or a, sub or a substitute for the judicature. That's where Justice Bhagwati said in that Samba Murti that sorry we will not entertain any of this. This appears to be completely shocking and subversive of the principle of rule of law. What is rule of law ultimately? That everybody has accepted country after country that the judicature, the judicial organ in the country is supposed to be the organ which will deal with the rights, determination of rights and expounding or coming out with solutions and determination so far as rights are concerned. Okay. So therefore, once that right is determined, you can't have an agency to sit in appeal over that, okay. correct? So therefore, you have to give that separation of powers. So that exactly is the idea. So the moment you have any kind of encroachment on that, that has to be completely taken care of. And so the slippery slope, bed, how do you ensure that that the slippery slope argument would not apply? That's very, slippery slope argument is what, ultimately? You, you deal with the matters to the extent possible. Now, let us test it this way. What did way with Justice Bhagwati and Ranganath Mishra and Sampath Kumar? They felt that yes, this is an alternative, effective mechanism which has been put in place, correct? So what is so sacrosanct about 226? 226 can be substituted by something else. You have an organ which is capable of exercising that power. But the idea was, why did that theory was not accepted? The theory was not accepted on the ground that here is an article which 226 is the basic power under the constitution. See, look at the extent of that. 368, when it comes to ratification, there are certain principles or certain provisions wherever you require the 50% ratification and the union judiciary and the high court and supreme court is part of that. So therefore the constitution has elevated this judicial organ to such level that you can't even by brute majority in the parliament can do away with that. You have to have whatever it is, you must have the majority from the states. That's the level to which it has been taken and therefore appropriately what the court thereafter in Chandra Kumar found that very well there cannot be any departure from that principle so therefore we will not accept. They did not go to the extent of saying that tribunalization is bad. The tribunal was saved. The only thing is that the rung of challenge which was negated under Sampath Kumar was restored. Correct? Anybody else? Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. I have two questions. One is in perspective of uh, we are celebrating 50 years of Keshubananda Bharati. We have under 100 crores of people in India and all we celebrate the uh, election process and all go to the parliament and choose and they represent us. They are expected to represent our aspirations in the parliament. So, don't you think that the, our democracy has become not matured as expected? That is why the, still we celebrate with the, the Keshavan and the Bharati. Or if we have a very mature democracy, we our legal representatives are competent to um, come up to our aspirations. Will this Keshwanada Bharati will have the same role 
or the independence of judiciary will be having the same role where it, it was not specifically enshrined in the constitution of india very difficult for me to answer this question whether our democracy must get matured to what level and at what juncture correct all these questions can be gone into for a student of law i can't answer these questions please correct this is as an ordinary citizen perhaps yes the aspirations are that our dem our representatives must be very very qualified very very conscientious very very considerate so far as the problems which the general public is facing and they must ventilate the grievance to the best of their ability that's the normal expectation as a citizen i must have from all the representatives beyond that i can't say anything due to paucity of time and the tight schedule of honorable mr justice yu yu lalit we may not be able to take further questions thank you thank you so much thank you on behalf of the organizers of this program the vice president of kerala high court advocates association advocate s biju will now add on honorable mr justice yu yu lalit with kerala's traditional kasavu aran mula kannadi or metal mirror is a traditional cultural gift from aran mula a sleepy village located on the banks of river pampa this kannadi is unique for what it is not this mirror is not made of glass but is an innovative decorated delivery of metallurgy and the making of it is a closely guarded secret of four families in aranmula handed down through generations in a world in love with images the mirror challenges its viewers with reality the reflection in the mirror without filters biases prejudices and halos is a reflection of law and justice as it ought to be I cordially invite the patron of Constitution Debate Club senior advocate PK Ravindranath Menon to present Aranmula Kannadi to honorable Mr Justice Yu Yu Lalit May I now request Senior Advocate Jaiju Babu, Patron of the Constitution Debate Club, for the concluding remarks. <clears throat> Honorable Justice. Mr. Yu Yu Lalit, Honorable Chief Justice of India, Justice Bachchu Kudin Thomas, Sri Devendra Menon Sir, Sri Biju, Sri Navin, Honorable Judges, Senior Advocates, my friends, ladies and gentlemen. my time is only should the time given to me is only 5 minutes to conclude my uh, remarks and with all humility i would like to say that i don't claim any competence to say any conclusive remarks 
on the highly informative and explanatory speech by honorable justice lalit as you all know independence of judiciary is a unique feature of the constitution indian constitution even though the, the, there are 193 countries in the world having written constitu constitution and about seven or so with a, with unwritten constitution this is the guarantee which separates indian constitution from other constitutions and the separation of powers is the reason for segregating the independence of the judiciary or is there a rakshana rekha in between was the reason for evolution of keshavana bharati case if i may say so as you know in a democratic setup the legislative functions are moves on political ideology at the same time the judiciary has no such political ideology or such separate ideology so it has to maintain an independent stage so this independent at the same time among the three separate organs even though there is separation of powers and we are conscious about article 50 of the constitution of india the the separation of powers give rise to one organ interfering with the powers exclusively you mark to the other organ and on this on this peripheral the celebrated decision in keshavananda bharati's case came where it was said that the basic structure of the constitution cannot be amended even by the parliament or the legislature this is upholding the in the minimal words the functional side of the judicature to review laws made by the legislature as well as executive action whereas a reciprocal power is unavailable to them taking as through the decisions of uh, from on the judicial review from marbury versus madison then followed by the on the on the two limbs his logic was separately dealt with the aspect on two limbs one the functional side and other on the organis on the organization or the structural side of the judicial system in india i don't trouble you all on going through the entirety the the structural side as well as the functional side as you know the appointment of judges in part 5 of the constitution then the segregations of legislation executive judiciary etc and then comes on the functional side the keshavananda bharati's case declared the position that the basic structure cannot be one of the basic structure is the uh, uh, independence of judiciary or the rule of law then uh, other is the secularism and many other that his lordship did not go into the other details so his lordship's conclusion is that ultimately his lordship concludes referring to the various judgments on uh, on the that is judgments taken over taken referred to were sambhat kumar and chandra kumar on the on the uh, functional side and thereafter his lordship has taken to taken the speaker's decision is also open to uh, open to judicial review these are the uh, way in which the lecture was, which the lecture went on and i also heard it like a, i was taken back to 40 years and i heard uh, this the all the lecture as a asif a law student and uh, after concluding this these two uh, these two aspects now the ultimate point on which I, i would like to place the one remark is that of course the constitution has given independence to judiciary the basic structure of the 
constitution cannot be touched is also declared. The laws made by the parliament as well as the executive action and even the action of the speaker in the, is the, are also open to judicial review to a certain extent. And the corollary is that the judges, uh, His Lordship has also taken to the judges, two judges appointment, three judges appointments case, as well as the NJC case also. So after the judges has to ensure justice to people, the people who approach the court are aggrieved by the laws and the executive action. And we expect, and everybody expects, the judges to ensure impartial justice while interfering with the laws as well as the executive action. I conclude my remarks I fully agreeing with the conclusion of the Honorable Justice Lalitha on the functional side and the organizational side. But nowadays after the recent decision or the even political unrest, when to ensure rule of law, they, when the courts render judgment to ensure in, uh, impartial justice, I find that in the democratic setup, there will be a, a set of people who will be unhappy. And the set of people who, who are unhappy on the present system of judicature, interpreting the, 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 the laws made by the legislature as well as the parliament and the executive action are now standing as a question mark to the, in the democracy when we deal with the subject of separation of powers and the power of judicial review. That question mark is something to be answered by the judiciary also. That what should be done with the people who are not happy with the judgments where the courts have rendered or, or rendered uh, in impartial judgments to render justice to the people who are aggrieved by the laws made by the parliament and the actions of the executive. There should be one set of people who are un unhappy in democracy where people, we, we say people made the, without the constitution. So those people have to be, the question made by the, those people who are unhappy with these judgments is according to me a question mark still prevailing in the democratic setup with these three organs and their limits. Thank you for this opportunity. Jai Hind. The official program draws to a close. The Kerala High Court Advocates Association and the Constitution Debate Club sincerely thank Honorable Mr. Justice UU Lalit for his Lordship's memorable lecture on an unforgettable judgment, Keshavananda Bharati versus State of Kerala. The organizers profusely thank Honorable Mr. Justice Bechu Kurian Thomas for his thought-provoking introductory remarks and his continuing guidance. We also thank Senior Counsel Advocate P.K. Ravindranath Menon, Senior Counsel Advocate Jeju Babu, Advocate T. Naveen, Advocate Biju, and the August audience who have taken time and effort to be here at this function. Thank you, one and all. Let us rise for the national anthem. Janagana mana adhinayaka jayahe Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha, Dravida, Uttkala, Vanga, Vindya, Himachal, Yamuna, Ganga, Uchal, Jaladhi, Taranga, Tava, Shubha, Name, Jage, Tava, Shubha, Ashish, Ma, 